am I audible to everyone there also yeah. thank you so the topic was inner change and there's a lot of inner change that has happened also <laughs> with respect to the topic <laughs> not the <coughs> not the content itself so i'll speak today broadly in three main points i'll initially start with a story from the ramayana briefly outline the story and then what inner change requires and how that can happen i'll talk about that all of us sometime or the other feel that i should change myself maybe i want to become healthier i want to become more disciplined i want to become this i want to become that it's very practically no one in the world thinks that the way i am i'm perfect if somebody thinks like that they are in perfect illusion <laughs> you know all of us have such glaring deficiencies and we all want to work on them but somehow we resolve to change and become a new me and we change we change for some time and after that while the new me is not looking the old me comes back again and we tend to revert to what we were before so this desire to change is something which is there within us or at least it comes up periodically within us but somehow to translate it into real life is difficult so what do we do for that purpose and how do we go about doing it recently there's the rama the ramnomi was there so some of you may have seen my book on the ramayana wisdom from ramayana on life and relationships so i'm writing a second book on that now second part of wisdom from ramayana and <clears throat> so in the ramayana there are many beautiful stories and uh, some of the stories are very small but if we go deeper into it then we see that there is a lot of import to it so when lord ram goes out in the forest he goes twice does anyone know which are the two occasions Yes. Any of the kids? How does he go twice? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um. When he went with um. With um Vishwamitra Muni. Yes. And when he got exiled. Yes. So first he went for a service, and second he was sent out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So now, when the first time he went out, he is still a, he is still a. a uh, young boy of course he is eternally supreme lord but while he is going to the forest so they first go to all vishwamitra's hermitage and then they uh, protect vishwamitra's sacrifice from the demons who are the demons maricha subha subha and one more tadaka tadaka yes three of them thank you and then after that vishwamitra says let us go to the where should we go now <laughs> mithila yes so you see in the ramayana and the mahabharat there are the similar many similarities i have a whole class on that similarity and differences but in the both the cases now both the main heroes go out twice go to the forest twice and in both cases in the first emergence from the forest is in a swayamvar there also the pandavas go from when the khandav is burnt they go to the forest and then they come in, at who swayamvar draupadi draupadi swayamvar yes so in this case when they are going toward mithila they go through various areas so there they pass by the forest and they come to a clearing and there's a hermitage over there so when they see this hermitage ram is ram and lakshman are intrigued by seeing this they say that actually he says this it looks completely uninhabited there is nobody staying over here and yet it doesn't look completely deserted if say na sab nobody even what to speak of a hermitage in a forest even in a house if nobody is staying in the house the house soon starts to run getting run down and if you want to sell a house also even if nobody is occupied still you have to periodically keep coming and cleaning the house otherwise it becomes very run down so they say that there's nobody staying over here but it doesn't look completely run down 
Why is that? So, Vishwamitra says that this was a this was a place where once great personalities were living, but because of an unfortunate series of events, because of deception, because of cheating, because of cursing, hmm, this place has now become deserted. Now, when now Rama and Lakshmana are young, they are deception, cheating, cursing. Sounds what? Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> what is all this? Please tell us the story. And seeing them in intrigued, Vishwamitra then starts telling the story. He says, this was, whose hermitage? Doesn't you know? Gautam. Yes, Gautam Muni's. So there is a, there is a uh, compilation called the Nam Ramayana. I think some of you have memorized it also, some of the verses. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there is a, a whole Ramayana is described through various names. Major incidents in the Ramayana are described through about a hundred names. So I'll recite some of the names and you can also repeat after me as we move forward. So Gautam Muni Sampujit Rama Gautam Muni Okay, only the kids know it, is it? <laughs> Gautam Muni Sampujit Rama Can you repeat? Gautam Muni Sampujit Rama Sampujit It was worshipped. So now what happens is that they come to the Gautam Muni's ashram. Now he has left that ashram. He is staying somewhere else at that time. So they meet him at a different time. But when they are here, it is erstwhile, previous ashram. So he says that this was so the abode of a very great sage Gautam, Vishy, and he lived there with his wife. What was her name? Ahalya. Ahalya. And now when they were living there, they were living a virtuous life. They were doing austerities and asceticism. But Ahalya was extremely beautiful. And before her marriage, many of the gods had desired to have her as their wife. But somehow, her marriage had happened with Gautam Rishi. And then that happened, <laughs> then all the gods recognized that and they didn't approach her. But sometimes a great power if somebody has, then that person thinks that no rules apply to me. So who was such a person? Indra. Indra. <laughs> so Indra, he often, there is almost every time you see in the scripture, Indra gets into trouble. Not only he gets into trouble, he gets others also into trouble. <laughs> it's one thing to get into trouble oneself. So what Indra decides to do is that he is looking for an opportunity to approach Ahalya. And then when Gautam Muni goes to the goes to the river to take a bath at that time. He takes on the garb of Gautam Muni. And then he comes there and he uh, goes inside with Ahalya and unites with her. And when Gautam Muni comes back at that time, Indra is trying to sneak out. Uh, when he tries to sneak out, and he, Gautam Muni sees over there. And now, normally, if you see somebody with a look alike of yours, sometimes even twins, if two twins are living together, then it's fine. But suppose two twins were separated at birth and then they meet each other for the first time. Who is this person? You start thinking, am I dreaming? Am I seeing the same person or what is this? So he's taken aback to see his exact look alike and then immediately understands what has happened. Because he's a sage, he has mystic vision. And he gets infuriated. He said, How dare you do such You are such a lusty person, I punish you. You're so proud of your power and attractiveness, I curse you, your body will become totally deformed. And Indra's body becomes horrendously deformed. And when Ahalya comes over there, she hears her husband's angry voice, she comes out and she's also angry. She's, she, she's about to ask forgiveness from him, but he is he's a sage, he is also angry. So he curses her also. You become a stone. And now, become a stone. He gets converted into a stone and then uh, he just walks away from there. Now, this is the narrative this is the version of the story that is most often told and in this version uh, Ahalya appears to be simply a victim of two men one with uncontrolled lust and the other with uncontrolled anger <laughs> <laughs> in fact somebody actually how I I was not planning to I wrote an article on this story right now for my new book I was not planning to write anything on this but somebody uh, after they read my Ramayana book, I, that I have also explained about uh, how why Sita was sent away. So they like that explanation. They said, can you explain this story also? 
and apparently somebody has made a spoof movie on this and they have turned uh, and that we, that movie has become quite uh, con controversially popular you could say and what is it it's a spoof like that that there is a char female character named ahalya and whoever man gets attracted to her that man gets converted into a stone <laughs> <laughs> and so this particular woman in her drawing room so not only that man gets converted into a stone that man becomes like a doll <coughs> and so she, you see in her drawing room she has a series of dolls <laughs> so all the women who have been converted like that so there is a, that this is ahalya's revenge <laughs> <laughs> now if you see actually speaking what happens over there you now as i said in the beginning itself and vishwamitra also said there's a great people living over there it was not just agastya who was it was not just gautam mushi was a great sage ahalya was also also a great person and when indra came there this is clearly mentioned in the valmiki ramayana but this is not often told in most retellings of the story that when indra came over there ahalya also had this equation and she recognized this is not gautam rishi she recognized this is not gautam rishi but what happened was that her feminine pride got intoxicated she said i am so attractive that even the god in the king of the gods is coming to me is not only coming to me he is adopting a whole guys to come to me and because of that because of that pride which went to her head there is a moment of weakness now just having a moment of weakness doesn't make her a villain but it means that she is not a victim alone different all of us in the world are vulnerable nobody uh, is nobody is invulnerable i gave recently a seminar in brisbane on burn anger before anger burns you so before that what happened was uh, many things went wrong before the program and i was getting annoyed and then suddenly i you know i was getting annoyed and i was about to get angry with some devotee and then it struck me i had to burn my anger before i could give this seminar <laughs> sometimes what happens when we get angry and we are resolved i'll never get angry i never get angry and then somebody reminds and we get, get something happens we start getting angry and then that person will say hey you are resolved not to get angry you getting angry i am not getting angry <laughs> 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 so what happens it's very difficult to actually discipline ourselves so moments of weakness come upon everyone and broadly speaking the force of illusion maya attacks different people in different ways so now of course this is a gender generalization and generalizations are never absolute but they are broadly indicative so broad happens is men desire women and women desire the desire of men men desire women and women desire the desire of men and both need to be regulated so whenever say a bond is formed a marriage is formed say every bond comes with a boundary with there cannot be any bond if you say there is no boundary to it so every bond means there is a boundary so for men the, the, their weakness is the desire for women so that has to be regulated when you get married for women <coughs> it is to attract the men have women have the desire their weakness is what to attract the desire of men so men desire women women desire the desire of men now this is again as it is not universal but it's broadly indicative uh, i have started traveling abroad for the last 4 5 years before that mostly i was in india and india also i was in mostly pune and mumbai so i was really living in a very you could say protected zone so then i started traveling abroad and mostly at least in india in traditional culture and traditional societies you know, women they very easily once they get married they shift to a maternal role and then they focus on that particular identity and that particular service 
Now, when I went to Australia for the first time, I was doing a college program, and I went. Some students, some good students were there, and there was young Mata Ji. She was uh, she uh, she was making the announcements, and she was very smart, intelligent. So after the class, I asked her, uh, "Do you study here?" And I couldn't understand. My class, my question made her so happy. <laughs> and then, then she just looked at me. She was so happy. And then, then suddenly, one small boy came running to her, and says, "He is my son." So he said, "I passed out ten ten years ago from here." <laughs> <laughs> so later on, another devotee, I didn't understand also at that time. Another devotee told me that she was so happy because I thought she was young enough to be a college student. <laughs> <laughs> so the point I'm making here is that all of us have our particular weaknesses, and we have to guard against those weaknesses. So Alia, in a moment of weakness, she gave in to the pride that Indra, the God of heavens, has come to me. And so when when Alia was cursed by Gautam Rishi, it was not just because of the transgression. If if she had just been a victim, the curse would have been unfair. But she also gave her consent. So basically, when we talk about inner change, that's our topic. So as the story goes on, mm-hmm. after Ahalya gets converted into a stone, then Gautam Muni just gets disgusted and walks away from there. But although Ahalya has made a mistake, she is not condemned. That's why what happens in that hermitage? Now Vishwamitra is here. Vishwamitra points. He says that just see that you can see this whole hermitage is deserted, is abandoned. But there is only one place where something is growing, and there was a stone, and on that stone, tulsi was growing. So that that tulsi was growing on that stone. He says, Vishwamitra said, "This is Ahalya." So she was not condemned. <laughs> tulsi is considered very sacred, and that tulsi was growing on the stone, which was her current body, indicate that she was not condemned. She was still considered all her past holiness, all her past uh, beautifulness, all her past dharma. It was there, and thus he said that, and the Vishwamitra said that she has been waiting, O Ram, for being blessed by your lotus feet. So your lotus feet. Now Ram normally throughout the Ramayana does not act like God. He acts like a normal human being, and as a normal human being, <coughs> he focuses on he focuses on doing his duty. So here he doesn't claim that I am God and I am going to bless her, but he says because Vishwamitra Muni has instructed him, so he goes accordingly. And as soon as he goes and touches the stone. Just with his feet, he just gently touches the stone, and what happens? Immediately, there's a transformation, and Ahalya manifests over there. As soon as Ahalya manifests over there, she folds her hands and offers prayers to Ram, and Ram, Vishwamitra, Lakshman, all of them are observing, and in front of their eyes, after offering prayers to Ram, taking his blessings, she departs for an elevated abode. So all her good activity that has done, they are not lost. They are there because of one one misdeed. She has some some reaction to that, but all her good deeds also stay with her, and they elevate her to a higher destination. So uh, I was giving a class in Australia. I just came from Australia, uh, so I was giving to a Western audience, and this one at the different they were asking different questions. So what happens? People who are completely new. Many of our rituals can seem very strange to them. So when one of the Western, I was in a talked at the top of a hill, a new Govardhan, where they have many Western people who come and stay in the broad temple, not premises in the temple, but in the temple premises. So there, when they were asking some question, they said that they had various, very, very, you could say, puzzling questions. Why puzzling? It was puzzling for them. He said, 
when you blow the conch why does everyone kiss the floor <laughs> we both we bow our head down so why does everyone kiss the floor <laughs> So when you put the head down, <laughs> they thought kiss the floor. And they said, "I uh, so." The other thing they asked was that. You know, I've heard that you take the dust of the feet of God. So are God's feet dirty? <laughs> <laughs> that you take the dust of the feet. <laughs> so actually, what to speak of the Lord's feet? Even the whole abode of the Lord. there is no dirt in it in fact in the bhagavatam it is described when 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 lord vishnu came to the sacrificial assembly of prithu maharaj the lord's feet do not even touch the ground he just he walks seems to be walking on the ground but his feet stay above the ground so there is no question of his feet being dusty or dirty but when we say take the dust of the lotus feet of the lord that does not mean say if we go to some house and then we touch a table and our half finger becomes touched with touch with dust he'll say this house is not cared for properly so the lord is not like that the idea of taking the dust of the lord lotus feet simply means submission see when we have to take the dust of someone's feet either we put our hand over there or we put our head over there so you know our hand and head are normally two two tools of power for us with our hand we can do a lot of things we do things and with our head we think head indicates that we are our, uh, our head is our highest part of the body and people say that sir jhuka sakte kata sakte nahi you know we'll we'll cut off our head nahi sir kata sakte jhuka sakte nahi so we'll cut off our head will not bow it down so the head is considered the highest part of our body so when we put our hand or our head down hand is what we do with which we do all the things in life but okay these hands i'm putting over here that means whatever i can do that is insignificant in comparison to what god can do and when we put our head on the feet of the lord what that means is that actually that part which is the highest in my body i make it the lowest i put it below the lowest part of the lord's body and that indicates submission so for ahalya just the touch of the lord lotus feet brought about that transformation and for all of us also we we have our weaknesses and we also would like to be transformed and for that transformation we want to get the lord lotus feet on our head the lord lotus feet bless us then we also can get transformed there are two broad ways to get transformation one is just by thinking by our will power but my will power i'll transform myself and it's possible but it is like say somebody has to lift a 50 or 100 kg weight now with their own effort they can lift it but it is tough however if there is a lever and you put the weight on the lever and then you apply force when you apply little force what happens the mechanism of the lever will raise the weight very easily so similarly for us we always have to apply effort without our effort nothing will happen but our devotion to the lord is like the lever so our anarthas our weaknesses our contaminations our vices they are weighing us down and we can try to lift that weight we can try to push it off but if we turn toward the lord connect with the lord then we get access to the lever and we apply a little force over here and there will be transformation over there so just as ahalya was transformed by the touch of the lotus feet of the lord we also can be transformed now it's interesting so this is this was the ahalya story of the first part of the talk and now the second part will be how we can get the blessing of the lord the way ahalya received it but any quick question till now that's not a short question <laughs> maybe i'll talk personally if you don't mind it'll take a little time to explain yeah when you said the lord doesn't walk on planet earth then how how do we see so many footprints of the lord no that's what i said that in that particular past time 
It's not in that in the Prithu Maharaj past time when he appeared, he he did not touch the feet of the Lord. He did not touch the soil. I think there's a difference between when the Lord descends uh, as a um, descends in response to someone's prayer or in some sacrifice, and when the Lord descends as an avatar. When the Lord descends as an avatar, definitely his feet do imprint, uh, create imprints. But when he comes just as a response to someone's prayer, that time. At least in that particular past time, it's like that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, at the beginning of the talk, you said that um, you always want like some change inside you. I mean, it's, it's rarely you find you can find people that are perfect. Well, if you you want to change in you, so you are perfect. So can, so you can be perfect. So can you explain that to everyone? Okay. Good question. So what you are saying is that you know, we want to change so that we can become perfect, but nobody is perfect. Yeah. So how to reconcile the two? Well, there are different meanings of the word perfect. The when we say perfect, uh, if if Shri Prabhupada uses example in Ishopanishad, it was Om Purnamada Purnamidam. Purnat Purnamudachate, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vashishate. So he says we are dependent complete and Krishna is the independent complete. So what this means is, say if this is my hand, the hand is a part of the body. Now the hand will be perfect when it can grip nicely, it is flexible, it, it has strength, it has resilience. So the hand's perfection is when it is able to do whatever a hand is meant to do. But the hand will never be able to do what the head is meant to do or what the stomach is meant to do. So, so even when we become perfect, that doesn't mean we have all abilities. When we are perfect, that just means that what we are meant to do, we are able to do. So we will all still have some limitations. Arjun was a great archer, but Arjun didn't have the mace fighting expertise that Bhima had. Arjun also knew Shastra, but he did not knew scripture as well as Yudhishthira did. So each of them was perfect for the role that they were meant to play. So when we say that we have weaknesses that we are meant to overcome, that means that what we have been given by the Lord, we have certain abilities. But because of our weaknesses, we can't use those abilities. So say if my, if I got a cut on my finger or if a finger is stubbed, stubbed or whatever, then I can't lift things with it. When the finger becomes healed, then I can use that hand for whatever a hand is meant for. So perfection doesn't mean uh, perfection in every respect. Perfection simply means that what we are meant to do, what we have been gifted with the ability to do, our own weaknesses, our own arathas don't come in the way of doing that. That's why I, uh, in seminars, I in college, I say spirituality increases our ability to tap our ability. We all have certain abilities, but because of our weaknesses, we can't tap that ability. So spirituality increases our ability to tap our ability. Okay. Good question. Thank you. So now, so I was talking about the second second part of the class is what? Do you remember? What is this? Um, what are the components for inner change? Yes, how we can get blessed by the Lord and how we can change ourselves. So there'll be three I's in this, or three I N basically: inclination, intelligence, and intention. Okay. So. In the Bhagavatam, often those who do not have devotion to the Lord are said to be stone-hearted. Pashana kashta, like a like a stone or like a piece of wood. If somebody doesn't feel attracted to the Lord, so now if we see a stone is among the most common objects around us, which is seen, which is said to be lacking in consciousness, lacking in emotions. 
so so if somebody if there is some terrible thing has happened and somebody doesn't feel any emotion at all at that time then you say how can you be so stone hearted so an inability to feel emotion is what characterizes a stone and similarly a, a person who does not experience emotions that is person who is stone hearted so what ahalya's cursing represents is that that because she acted in a stone hearted way she did not consider her relationship with with her husband she did not consider her dharmic duty she deadened herself to her higher emotions and the result of that was she became a stone similarly for us when we deaden ourselves to our higher emotions then we lose that capacity to experience those emotions we lose that capacity and if somebody is a butcher and say they have a family of a tradition of butchers in their family then say the butcher cuts animals and then the butcher gets one's children and he gets his son to also to the to the slaughter place now some people say that actually you know what is wrong with eating meat is it that uh, you, you you kill vegetables and we kill animals you are also killing we are also killing what is the difference well yes both there there's killing in both but there is a big difference even from a scientific perspective the nervous system is much more developed in animals than in plants and animals feel far more pain than when plants do and especially when we take fruits from plants there is no there is no violence at all the fruits just fall when crops grow up if the crops are not cut the crops will dry out or the crops when they blossom they are nearing the life span's end where the animals when they are slaughtered they are at the prime of their life not near the end of their lives and if somebody says no 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 this is just natural nature's arrangement and we can ask a simple question okay so if your child is in school and your in a child comes and says our teacher said today that we are going for a field ex- field trip he says where he says we are going to a farm to see a harvesting festival oh yeah nice you can go and see how the crops are harvested but if your child comes and says oh our ch- uh, we are going to a field trip to a slaughter house to see how animals are slaughtered how many parents would want their child to go to a slaughter house <laughs> now if you go to a farm for harvesting there is a mood of celebration of jubilation nature has opened its heart opened its arms and given us gifts and we are gratefully accepting the gifts N- there are almost in every culture there is a harvesting festival mm. in very few if any culture there is a slaughtering festival slaughter especially mass slaughter house slaughtering where butchers kill animals in mass that's ghastly so the point i'm making over here is that when a butch i was talking about how our consciousness becomes like stone so initially when a butcher is killing animals and the butcher say gets his son over there and when the son sees an animal you know, maybe a chicken or a goat or whatever the son is told kill like this his hand trembles no i can't do it but then he kills once and oh sees all the blood splattering around he's shocked but in the second time third time fourth time and after that you know, they kill animals like we might cut sabji they're chatting with each other tak 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 and while killing animals what has happened desensitization so we all have the capacity to experience higher emotions but when we choose to do an action that violates that emotion then what happens we stop experiencing that emotion we stop experiencing that emotion that is desensitization and this desensitize so with with respect to the animals the butcher has become stone hearted so our theme is about stone and stone heartedness and now even tukaram maharaj is a famous maharashtrian saint and he says that when a butcher 
kills animals. The butcher cuts off the neck of the animal, but the butcher is very careful not to let even a small finger get cut for himself. So they are so sensitive to their own pain, but completely desensitized to the pain of the animals. So when it's the, why I am talking about all this is that when we become stone hearted, there is a difference between becoming a stone and becoming a stone hearted. A stone just can't do anything. A stone can't harm anyone. Unless somebody picks up the stone and hits someone with it. <laughs> the stone itself can't harm anyone. But stone hearted people can be very dangerous. Very dangerous because the, the human capacity to experience another person's pain, they may lose that. And if they lose that, then it's terrible. So we all have become to some extent desensitized. We have all become stone hearted with respect to the Lord and with respect to many other things. This is Ahalya from a stone became a conscious being. We also want to change ourselves from being stone hearted to being soft hearted. And for that, there are broadly three things. There is, as I said, intention, sorry, inclination, inten intelligence and intention. So inclination means what? Like uh, this whole, what I was talking about till now is about inclination. We all have certain inclinations that we are born with and all these inclinations grow over time. So by our choices, certain inclinations can grow and certain inclinations can stay as they are. There are two kinds of people in the world. Some people are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, now how did they become like this? That's also by inclination. Now, if somebody keeps acting foolishly, that's how they gradually become foolish. Somebody keeps acting wisely, gradually they become wiser and wiser. So by inclination, I mean that it is that they don't even have to think about it. It just comes automatically. So for example, say if we come from a cultured family, if, if say we're walking and our foot touches somebody's body, then immediately our hand goes and we touch it to our head. I'm sorry about that. Now nobody, we don't have to consciously think, oh, this is a person and that, they, that body is, the Lord is present over there. That's why the body is sacred. I shouldn't touch their body. We don't even think about it. Inclination, we could say, it's almost like a programmed response within us. Now the programming can be good, the programming can be bad. So we all have certain inclinations and the ultimate success of bhakti is that our inclinations itself change. We are currently inclined towards worldly things and we become inclined towards the Lord. But first we have to begin with understanding what our inclinations are. And then accordingly, according to inclinations, whatever our weaknesses, we need to guard ourselves against it. So we have certain inclinations. Second point is intelligence. Now, intelligence is a very interesting concept because there is a, a whole amount of irony surrounding intelligence. What is the irony? That there are many people who are brilliantly stupid. <laughs> what do you mean by brilliantly stupid? That means they are very intelligent, brilliant. But the action that they do is stupid. Is stupid. Now there was a friend of mine, his brother was an alcoholic. And what happened now? He was from a very wealthy family. So whenever this person would go, you know, even if he had no money, so he was alcoholic and he was trying to recover from alcoholism. So then they had told all the bars over there that, you know, please don't serve him anything. Hmm? And they would not have money with him. But even if he would go, because such a wealthy place he was, he was from a wealthy family, so they would still give him even if he had no money. So then they told specifically all the bars, don't give him anything. So what he would do is, so one day he said, I just want to go for a ride. And he went for a ride. And then he said, oh, my car is broken down. I need a tow. He called up. And then they towed the car and they brought it back. And then normally if somebody is alcoholic, then there is somebody who monitors them because, you know, they might go out and they might again, if they're trying to recover, but it's almost like the urge keeps coming again and again. 
So one night this this devotee he woke up and he saw his brother was sneaking out somewhere. And he followed him where is he going? He went to the car. And then he opened the car gas tank. And then he had got a straw. And he put the straw in the car gas tank and he was drinking from there. <laughs> so so what he had done was he had he had actually gone to a bar somewhere far away where they did not know that he was alcoholic there was no bar for him and he had got bottles of alcohol and put it all in the car tank and then he said i car can't move so then he had got the car towed and now he had come at night and he was trying to drink from it so you know it's it's so sad he said when i saw this i, I was i i didn't know whether to be angry or to feel pity because i realize normally when we when when somebody keeps doing something which uh, which they say i will not do which we also tell them don't do it but they keep doing it we sometimes feel that this person has no will power has no integrity no character no intelligence but it's not like that see when sometimes we become conditioned then that conditioning torments us when it torments us then we just push push do this do this do this do this so now actually getting alcohol in a car gas tank that is the example of being brilliantly stupid <laughs> it requires brilliance to think of such an idea but you know to get it get alcohol like that it's stupid so our intelligence it can be very very resourceful to do certain things but what it will do that purpose we need to have clearly so for us when we start practicing bhakti when we study scripture when we understand scripture regularly then our intelligence becomes spiritualized then that means the intelligence starts becoming creative and resourceful for doing good things for doing constructive things and that's how we can move forward in our life so whatever intelligence we have we use it for serving krishna and we try to find a come out with creative ways of how we can serve krishna and rather than seeing bhakti simply as a ritual that i have to follow you see you have to use our own intelligence to think how can i serve krishna and if we start using that krishna will give us so much creativity krishna will give us so much creativity about how we can serve now we all uh, often participate in rathyatra festivals now how prabhupa started the rathyatra actually prabhupa was just chant he was in san francisco and he was chanting and he was sick actually so he was chanting in the he was staying in a house like an upper story and he was chanting and walking and he looked out and there he saw a, a truck with a flat bed and just by seeing that truck he thought hey we can put jagannath baldev subhadra over here now how many of us see a truck and think of jagannath baldev subhadra is a wrong thing about it but that is prabhupada's intelligence so using our intelligence doesn't this doesn't mean memorizing some verses or giving some talks intelligence means we try to become creative how can i serve krishna and we start doing that we will get stimulation we will get set will in will get inspiration will get satisfaction so how can i do good how can i contribute to my own spiritual growth to other spiritual growth when we start using our intelligence in bhakti bhakti will start becoming uh, lively for us if you think of bhakti simply as a ritual oh i have to go to this program i have to chant this round i have to do this puja once you are thinking of that as a ritual then we will not we will not be able to stay connected for very long we will start getting bored very soon but this will bring if we start using our intelligence as an intelligence doesn't necessarily at all mean just memorizing verses if we can that's wonderful intelligence simply means that whatever we are doing we try to become more creative how can i do this better for krishna how can i do something better for krishna and what are the last intention intention yeah now intention means that we ourselves should 
want to change let me say obviously i want to change yes we all want to change but the problem is that we don't maintain that desire so we want our inclinations to change that is going to take a long time it's definitely going to take a long time intelligence we can start using it creatively but intention is what if we maintain then we will find krishna's reciprocation i'll conclude with two examples to talk about his intention see sometimes as i said we make some resolution i will do this and then do it for some time and after that i can't do it we give up so when this happens we need to understand that actually it's not that we lost we see that our urges whatever it is it may, be, it may be anger it may be greed it may be a particular attachment whatever it is now if we consider the graph of time versus the urge so it's not that the urge is high always sometimes the urge goes high the urge has a surge hmm when the urge has a surge then at that time what happens is if we decide i'll never get angry and then we get angry and afterwards we beat ourselves why did i get angry like this so what happens is when the urge comes it goes up it at that time it is almost difficult to resist it but it does not stay up all the time afterwards it becomes normal and then it may come back again but what do we do in between Now, even if we can't resist the urge we can persist between the urges even if we can't resist our urges we can persist between our urges yes i didn't want to do it but i did it okay but what do i do after that if i keep beating myself up why did i do that why did i do that why did i do that then what is happening i am not doing anything to strengthen myself so yes sometimes because of our past inclinations past conditionings the urges may come up and it may be almost impossible to resist at that time but you don't have to become disheartened Now, we may fall down but we don't have to fall away fall down means you want to follow something but we couldn't follow it fall away means we just give up we just give, we should never we never give up what we understand is i can rise again so the same mind which makes us fall down it also tries to make us fall away suppose i'll i think i gave this example last time also suppose we are living a normal law abiding life and a friend comes to us and says you know i got a scheme to get rich quickly he says what is that now if anybody says that after that nobody can resist asking what is it is <laughs> it at least you want to know what is the scheme so he says you know we can rob a bank he says what <laughs> says, no 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 he says no i have got a foolproof plan we'll rob the bank and we'll run away and nothing will happen he says no 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 but some of this friend is very forceful and we agree and then we go along to rob the bank and when we are in the bank about to take the money suddenly some alarm rings and this friend runs away and we are trapped <laughs> and then we are caught we are arrested and brought to the court and when we come into the court and we see sitting as the judge is this very friend <laughs> 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 so our mind is like that <laughs> our mind first makes us do wrong and then beats us you fool why did you do that so we decide okay i'm going to wake up early in the morning and then when the alarm rings the mind also rings go to sleep <laughs> and then we go to sleep you know in the, in our clock there may be many buttons the button we use the most is the snooze button is <laughs> it so we snooze it and then we keep snoozing it and then we wake up after 1 hour or 2 hours and the same mind says you fool when will you learn you are so lazy you are hopeless you are useless <laughs> so now what happens is first the mind only said go to sleep and the mind now beats up you are lazy you are a fool you are useless and then we wake up late what happens is not only we wasted time but the mind has also put us in a bad mood and even if we are awake we can't do anything Mm-hmm. so what happens so if we understand that the mind has this devilish double role the devilish double role is first it makes us do wrong and then 
it beats us up for doing wrong. So I'm talking about the point of intention. That okay, even if I couldn't resist the urge, but still I will maintain my intention. I won't beat myself. Okay, I couldn't do it at that time. Now what can I do? If we maintain our intention, we will succeed. We will gradually. What will happen as the urge is moving? The urge may come. We may not be able to resist. But in between, if we maintain our intention, with our intention, we try to practice bhakti. We try to connect with Krishna. We try to serve Krishna. We get. our stone like heart in touch with the lord lotus feet when we remember him when we try to serve him that's what is happening and by that we will become transformed so even if we can't resist our urges we persist between our urges and by that we will become strong that's our that's maintaining our intention no matter what happens i will stay determined to serve krishna that's maintaining the strength of intention and another point is we will say but what about the urges And the urges come still they overpower me. Yes, they will overpower us. But as we stay connected with Krishna in between the urges, we start becoming stronger. We start becoming purer. And as we start becoming purer, then we will get the strength to resist the urges also. I'll conclude with this example. Say, have any of you played arm wrestling? Mm-hmm. All of you played? <laughs> okay. So when you play arm wrestling, suppose there is like a timed arm wrestling match. You know, say in three minutes you have to push the other person's arm down, and now the other person might be much stronger than us, and they pushed our hand right down, 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 and it's almost gone. Now you think, ah, this person is so strong. How can I resist it? Now we can't resist it, but if you remember, it is a timed round. We don't have to resist for all time. It is just for three minutes, and we might be almost on the ground. But if we resist it till the third minute, then the round will be over, and the next round won't start from here. The next round will start from here. So if we can just survive the present round, we will begin on neutral ground. We'll begin on neutral ground. So our urges are like that. When the urge has a surge. At that time, if I just can't resist it, how long can I resist it? Even if I resist it, eventually I have to give up. So better let me give up now only. But it is not like that. The urge is not going to stay forever. That's what the mind tricks us. Mind tricks us saying that okay, you're already down. Now go down completely. But no, not needed. The urge will be there for some time. If we tolerate it, the urge will go away. The no urge stays forever, so it's like when we are trying to resist our urges, resist trying to fight our weaknesses. We need to know that it's like a timed arm wrestling match, so it's not going to go on forever. And that's why Krishna says, "Shakno tihai vayah sodhum prakshirir vimokshanat kama krodhod bhavam begam sayukta sa sukhi na raha sayukta sa sukhi na raha." Such a person is well situated who one who tolerates. So tolerance means what? The hand is almost down, but no, it's down, but it's not out. It's down, not out. And I just hold on, hold on. The urge will go away, and that's how if you just maintain the intention, even if we can't have the execution, I can't have my hand straight. But just maintain the intention. By that intention itself, purification will come. By that intention, connection will stay. By that intention, purification will happen. and krishna ultimately sees our intention he also knows that we are conditioned he knows how much we are struggling with our conditionings he knows our weaknesses but he just sees how much is our intention to connect with him if we just maintain that intention to connect with him then he will give us reciprocation he will give us purification he will give us devotion and when he gives us he gives us attraction to him then it's by the maintaining the intention with our intelligence our inclination changes once our inclination changes we become naturally attracted towards krishna we become naturally attracted toward doing constructive things in his service and thus at that time our stone heart just as the halya got transformed our heart also gets transformed from stone hearted we become soft hearted now our heart becomes soft like like what but and butter thief comes and steals it 
when he steals our heart then our heart is safe with him forever so you want krishna to come and steal our change our stone hearted heart stone heart into a soft butter like heart and come and steal it that's why when we chant the holy names when we worship krishna when we do seva it's what we are trying to do is we are trying to get the lord lotus feet to touch our stone heart we are trying to get him to steal our heart and when he does that we will become transformed then the inner war will no longer be there not only will the no inner war will be there but rather will be inner joy as we stay steadily and joyfully connected with krishna so i'll summarize quickly i spoke on this theme of inner change and i started how we want to change but something changes us back to the original although we change for the new so why does that happen so i talked about the story of ahalya how she gave in to a moment of weakness she is not a victim she is not a villain she is in between like all of us we are not entirely bad we are not entirely good we have we are in between so her weakness was that she felt proud that a person as great as indra is coming to attract it to me so she, so when she became desensitized to her higher duties to her relationship with her husband to her dharma then the desensitization led to her getting completely desensitized and becoming like a stone becoming a stone and lord ram's lotus feet coming and touching his uh, touching her stone body transformed her and what happened historically and when lord ram came that can happen in our hearts also and i talked about how when we want to transform ourselves i talked about three eyes what is it inclination yes excellent the first was inclination that we are naturally inclined towards certain things and this is almost like a programmed response it some some of it can be good some of it can be bad and we and by the way we act we also change, shape our inclinations let's take a animal's slaughterer's son first doesn't want to kill but then habitually starts killing because they become desensitized a stone can't do a, can't harm anyone but a stone hearted person because they are desensitized towards some people they can do a lot of harm to others so when we when ultimately we want to become purified and have our inclination toward krishna right now we need to be aware of our inclinations so that we can guard ourselves when i talked about intelligence is that some people are brilliantly stupid, stupid. stupid. they use their intelligence to fulfill their lower desires like using a car gas tank to have alcohol within it so what we need to do is instead of thinking of bhakti as a ritual we use our intelligence to creatively think how can i resourcefully serve krishna then when we start using our intelligence like this our bhakti will become stimulating for us and the last was intention i talked about how our urges sometimes they may overpower us but the urge are not always at the same level they sometimes surge and even if we can't resist when the surge happens even if we can't resist our urges we can persist between our urges and i talked about this mind being like a person who first makes us rob a bank and then judges us and punishes us for robbing it like we wake don't my mind says go to sleep in the morning and then beats us up why did you why are you so lazy so okay even if we succumb to the urge we don't listen to the mind after that okay i will maintain my intention to serve krishna no matter how many times i fall we may fall down but we don't fall away and then not only can we persist between the urges but we can resist the urge also if we understand that actually this surge in the urge is not going to last forever it's like a timed arm wrestling match if i just survive the present round i will resume on neutral ground so by maintaining the intention to serve krishna even if we can't have execution right now we attract his mercy because he sees the sincerity the seriousness of our intention and then when he gives his mercy just as he touched ahalya and transformed similarly he can touch and transform us stone heart into a soft heart and when he attracts our heart like krishna steals butter he steals our heart then our heart goes with him it's permanently safe and permanently joyful thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna any questions yeah Please. intentions and desires are same same uh good question 
are intentions and desires the same not exactly i would say desires are something which are more fleeting they come and go if you see 2.17 in the bhagavad gita apuryamana machala pratishtham samudram apah pravishanti yadvad tadvat kamayam pravishanti sarve sashanti mapnoti na kama kami so here krishna uses this beautiful very pregnant phrase compound word kama kami now literally what does it mean the desirer of desire kama kami the desirer of desire what that means is uh, the example that is given also very interesting is the example of rivers flowing into a ocean and just as rivers flow into ocean similarly desires flow into the consciousness now normally we do, we don't think so much of desires flowing into us as desires flowing out of us isn't it we see some object and we desire it so normally think of desires going out from us so what is krishna referring to over here is a reverse flowing in so what it means is that no kama kami that means the desire comes it's a you could not don't be a desirer of desire means don't don't you could say don't have intention toward the proposition so the desirer of desire means desire means the temptation comes from outside the proposition comes from outside and intention is what i accept it so i would say the desires we can't stop desires will just keep coming of course when we become very pure even the desires may stop coming it's like say suppose some of some of us might have been eating meat earlier but we start practicing bhakti now for a few years then even if we are traveling on a train or a plane and a neighbor opens some food with meat we don't think oh i want to eat this you know at least for that temptation we can say our lips curl in distaste <laughs> at least for that it happens so what happens when the desire has not come but for most of the temptations desire may come but the intention need not be there if we start thinking that desire itself should not come that's too difficult it is we are trying to if we make that the standard we will set ourselves up for frustration and disappointment desires will come because to some extent desires are biological responses just like on ekadashi also maybe fasting but if we see some food some non ekadashi food there's a mouth may water now if i start saying my mouth should not also water that is a test of my purity <laughs> well <laughs> that may not happen <laughs> isn't it so we cannot deny the there is the biological there is the psychological and there is the spiritual so there will be certain biological responses which will automatically come and the biological will come to the psychological level also just like say when you say desirable food mouth starts watering and the desire comes in but by the spiritual intention we can ensure that the biological doesn't take over the psychological completely it may come in the mind but we don't entertain it that's why i said temptation may come we don't have to welcome <laughs> okay thank you any other questions desire is a symptom of life also thinking feeling willing desire would come or we could transform it spiritually yes thinking feeling willing are the basic symptoms of consciousness so desires will come prabhupad says in one place that krishna consciousness means to desire everything for krishna so what are desirable objects are there in the world we see we see somebody very intelligent so this person becomes a devotee that's what the vaishnavas in navadvip they say if this nimai becomes a devotee he can become such a powerful devotee if somebody is very attractive you know they they become devotees then people are attracted to attractive people then through them people can get attracted to krishna so yes desire is always going to be there but what we desire or for what we desire that can change Okay. Very brilliant. Yeah. Explain. This it could be applied to calm, flow, low, move, but mm-hmm. also to everything wherever we have inclination. Yeah. Apply for that. I seek your blessings so that I can apply myself. It's easy to talk about these things, okay. but to apply is always a struggle. We are all struggling. You know? It's so these are all like weapons. I am also using this in my inner war, and I hope these help you in your inner war also, for all of you. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhu Pad ki. Yeah.
गौर भक्त बिंद की हिताय गौर प्रेमानंद